1 Thessalonians this morning as we continue our series on the essentials of our faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And I'm going to teach a little bit differently today than what I normally do. So if you're, you know, usually here and you're going to go, well, that's, that's a little bit different the way you handled that than the way I normally do. Usually I just take a passage and we just go right down through it, explaining it. And not that we're not going to do that in a sense, but we're going to go to a lot of other passages of Scripture or verses of Scripture today. And we usually don't take uh, the time to do that today. But I felt like that the, the passage we're looking at today really lent itself to that and that the Lord was leading me to do so. So, uh, Hopefully, you know, we're going to have a great time in the Word of God again this morning. I just want you to follow along with me as I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 through 28. It says, Paul says, Now may the God of peace himself make you completely holy, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept entirely blameless, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is trustworthy, and he will in fact do this. Brothers and sisters, pray for us too. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a holy kiss. I call on you solemnly in the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Paul here is talking about the essential of being whole. W-H-O-L-E. In fact, Paul's going to talk to us here about becoming holy whole. W-H-O-L-L-Y, W-H-O-L-E. And he uses a lot of this language to to talk to us about becoming holy, whole, if you will. You see that here. He starts off by talking to us about the God of peace. And that word speaks about joining or tying together something into a whole. When all the essential uh, parts come together, if you will. This is what God wants to do. He wants to bring us together, in a sense, corporately as the body of Christ, and he wants us, as individual believers in him, to begin to become whole, if you will. As I've shared before, when we become a Christian, we get all of God. We don't get God piecemeal, like, okay, I get a little bit of God when I get saved, and then, and then I, I go down a little bit further, and then God gives me a little bit more of himself. No, that's not the way it works. The Bible teaches that when we become a Christian, we get all of God. But God doesn't get all of us. And so our Christian life, and one of the reasons why we need to be willing to, to grow and mature in our faith is because it is through that process, in a sense, that God takes us through where more and more of us becomes more and more of His. Where we become whole, if you will. Because what Paul is teaching here and other places in the New Testament is the only way you and I become whole, W-H-O-L-E, is when we are in the process of becoming whole. Holy, His, if you will, as believers. And so that's talking about every part of us. And can I say, that that's why it, it, it sort of doesn't even make sense when Christians treat their faith and their walk with Christ as sort of like a part-time job. Like... You know, this thing with God is stuff that I do sort of part-time. You know, I've got this over here, and, and I do that, and I do this, and, and my relationship with Christ, and my faith, and my journey with Christ, and all that, it's just sort of something that, 
that it, it's a part of my life, and it's not that it's not important, but it's just sort of a part-time thing. Because what the Bible teaches is that when you and I enter into a relationship with the God of the universe, he never intended for, at least from his perspective, to be a part-time thing, but an all-in thing. A full-time thing. It's not like, you know, well, I'm a Christian on Sunday morning, and, and, and maybe a couple other times during the week, but the, the rest of my life and the rest of my week and all these other hours, they're mine. And, and I give God, you know, I, I try to give God, you know, some prime time, but not, not full time, not, not full in. What Paul's saying here is, well, then if that's not our perspective or mindset, then we've not really ever come as a Christian to the understanding of what God did in our salvation or what God wants to do in our salvation, which is what Paul's bringing up here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. When he says, now may the God of peace himself make you completely, the word completely means holy, entirely holy. The word holy speaks about being totally consecrated and dedicated to God. That I, God, I'm all in with you. I, I'm, I'm learning not to hold anything back. And I'm learning not to approach my life as if, as if I compartmentalize my life where it's like, God, I'll give you this, this, and this, but I got this, this, and this. That, that's not being completely holy. Holy is understanding that, that we're not our own, as Paul says to the Corinthians. We've been bought with the price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and we are no longer our own. We belong to God, and therefore our lives should be living in, in a direction where we are giving more and more of ourselves to God, being separated to Him. And that's what Paul means here. And then he himself even says, oh, and by the way, may your spirit, your soul, and your body. So Paul's trying to paint us a picture and saying, and I'm talking about the material part of you, and I'm talking about the immaterial parts of you. He says when God saved you, he wants all of us. He doesn't want just a piece of us or a part of us. He wants all of us. And he will do that work to bring about that wholeness in our life as for the rest of our lives until we go to be with Jesus. This is why Paul uses these terms. He wants the Thessalonians and us to understand in no uncertain terms, it's about all of us. It's about our spirit. It's about our soul. It's about our body. It's about every part of us. Paul says. And then he says, and may all of these be kept entirely, there again, holy or completely blameless within the sphere, if you will, of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul then sort of ends this thought with, and he who calls you, who invites you and I personally by name, he is trustworthy, he is faithful, he is reliable, he is dependable. He'll do it. He'll make it happen. Because Paul even said to the Philippians, he who has begun a good work in you and in me will continue to perform that work until the day of Jesus Christ. See, what, what Paul is also reminding us of is, as frustrating as maybe we at some times can be to God, God never gives up on us. And God never gets so frustrated or so exasperated with us because we're uncooperative where he just says, I'm done. No, never. God will always keep trying to draw us more and more to himself and to draw out of us more and more of ourselves to him. Because God understands. I want you to be whole. And God understands as our creator that the only way you and I get whole is by becoming wholly his. 
The word peace that's used here and throughout the New Testament most of the time really does paint a great picture for us of, of, of what God is trying to produce and do in our lives. He wants us to be at peace, to have that sort of state of tranquility, but he understands if I feel like my life is in all these different directions, and when you talk to even Christians today, you, you find this out in the world in which we live. Oh man, there's a piece of me, and, 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 and the piece of me over here, it's running after that, and then I've got a, another piece of me here, and it, it's going after that, and I've got another piece of me here, and I've got my mind in this direction, in that direction, all that. And what God tries to teach us is, you realize when your mind and your life and your body is going in all these different directions, you have no peace, right? You're not, there, there's no tranquility in your life. You're just, you're spread to the, as we say, to the four winds, and you're going here, there, and everywhere, and you're never at peace. And so what God is saying is, would you listen to what I'm trying to tell you, and would you be willing to follow my way? And here's my way to peace. Simply focus your life wholly on me and on becoming more and more of mine. Give me more and more parts of your life that you haven't yet surrendered, and you will actually find that in you focusing on becoming wholly mine, that peace that so eludes you will actually be very much present in your life. And you'll no longer feel like, oh my goodness, my mind's over here and there and everywhere, if we're saying, God, it's all about you and you first. And making our life with you and our relationship with you the priority of our life. And then these last verses in 1 Thessalonians 5 is all about where Paul's saying, and by the way, as we learn to cooperate with God in making us more whole people, he said, God never intended for that process to be in a vacuum where we're out there trying to do it on our own. No, no, no. God said, it must be done, because this is my way, this is the way I designed it. It must be done within a corporate body of believers. Which is why he says, hey, brothers and sisters, part of a spiritual family, pray for us. And then he goes on to talk about the fact that even when this letter comes. Make sure that everybody in the church gets to hear this letter. This letter isn't just for a select few of people in the church. These thoughts and this truth is for everybody in the church because everybody's supposed to be coming together and everybody's supposed to have equal chance to hear what God has to say. So these are the things that Paul shares here about being whole. Now I want you to leave 1 Thessalonians and I want you to travel to some other places in the New Testament with me that I think will illustrate and expand on and expound on what Paul here has talked about to the Thessalonians at the very end of 1 Thessalonians. And you'll find, I think, if you've sort of zeroed in on some of this language and some of the wording here, that Paul has used, you're going to see this language then in these other passages and other verses repeated. Because again, it's an essential of our faith. It's a concept that is continually taught throughout the New Testament. Just maybe from a little bit of a different angle, if you will. And sometimes it's good to look, look at sort of the same truth but from maybe a little bit different angle because sometimes for some of us, the one angle sort of like hits us but for others, it's like, well, I don't really get it from that angle, but oh, when you brought that up, oh, now I get it. I can see that. And so that's why it's good sometimes to, to see the same truth that's being taught, but to do so maybe just with a little bit of a different angle to it. So with that said, leave 1 Thessalonians now for today and travel with me first back to the book of Colossians, just a few books to the left of First Thessalonians, the book of Colossians. And you will see here, and I'm just going to pick out this one verse for the sake of time today, verse 22 of chapter 1. 
where the purpose of our salvation, the purpose of Jesus, the God of the universe, coming in a human body and living his life as a human being and going to the cross and dying for us and all of that had a purpose behind it. And that purpose wasn't just the forgiveness of our sins. That purpose wasn't just us entering into a relationship with God. That purpose was to make us whole. And you see this here in Colossians 1, verse 22. Look at it with me. Paul says, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy, without blemish, and blameless before him. It doesn't mean perfect. What it, these words are talking about is whole. The purpose of Jesus coming in his physical body and dying on the cross for us was to make us whole, you see, before him. Now, keep that verse in mind and go over with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. We're going to read a little bit more in the book of Ephesians. And I want to start in verse 25. This is a passage that deals with the marriage relationship, in a sense. The, the responsibilities of husbands and wives. But in this great passage for husbands and wives, Paul is also teaching us something very important about our own relationship with Christ and again, the purpose of our salvation. Notice what Paul says. Husbands, love your wives. Then he says, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So now Paul's sort of going to suspend his specific comments to the husband here. And he's going to say, now, now what I'm about to say now relates not so much to the husband and wife, but to Christ and the church. And, and I want you to get something here because the, the relationship between a husband and wife parallels Christ's rela relationship with the church to some degree. But it's also something that every Christian needs to get because it's an essential of our faith. What is it Paul wants us to grasp here? He says, well, when Christ came and gave himself for the church, it wasn't just, again, to bring us into relationship with him. It was to sanctify her by cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. In other words, Paul's saying that as his people, we need to be cleansed, even though we have been purified by God and justified in God's sight when we became a Christian because we live in a fallen world and we still have that fallen nature within us, we need to have sort of a spot cleaning, if you will. I talked about this Tuesday night. It's amazing to me how I don't plan this at all because I could never figure this all out. But how many times what I'm teaching on Tuesday dovetails with what I'm teaching on Sunday. And it was, it was in the passage where Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples. And he comes to Peter and says, Peter, I, I need to wash your feet. And Peter's like, abhorred that Jesus would wash his feet. He said, no, you, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus basically says, if, if I don't wash your feet... You don't have any share with me. You, you, don't, you can't have fellowship with me. You can't partner with me if you don't let me wash your feet. He said, now look, you've been completely clean, meaning because you believed in me as your Savior, there was a once and for all purification by God, a total bath, if you will, in the blood of Jesus. So Jesus says, you don't need to go back time and time again and be completely bathed again. All we need to do is get bathed once, but we need constant foot cleansing, if you will. Because as we travel through this world, our feet get dirty. 
And in order not to maintain a relationship with God, because that's rock solid, that's based on our faith in Christ alone. But our fellowship, our partnership with God is based on our cleansing, if you will. Making sure that we are walking down the same road as God is and keeping ourselves clean. And how does God do that in our lives? Through his word. He cleans us through his word. He keeps us clean so that we can have fellowship with him and partner with him throughout our lives. Then notice why he does this. Verse 27. So that he may present the church to himself as glorious, not having a stain or wrinkle or any such blemish, but holy and blameless. Same words that were used in Colossians. Same wording that Paul used now in 1 Thessalonians 5. To make us whole. This was what Jesus wants to do. He wants to make us wholly his. So that we can be whole. So that when the church is raptured and we are before him, he can present us as whole, if you will. Now again, here's what the Bible teaches. We are already whole, if you will, positionally before God. Because we have been placed in Christ through the Holy Spirit. But practically speaking, again, as I said earlier in the message, we're not whole. We're not there yet. Because there are parts of our lives that we have not yet given over to God. There are, there are places in our soul or spirit or our body, if you will, that we have not surrendered to God so that all of us isn't wholly his. We're not all in yet. And that's what the Christian life is all about. It is getting us more and more, if you will, to be all in with God. Not holding any specific part or place of our lives back, but understanding what the Bible teaches that is essential to our faith. That this whole Christian life and this journey with God and this, this path of discipleship that we're on, there's a great purpose behind it. And that purpose is this, and I'm just going to get very specific right now. God's going to come along periodically in our life as we grow, and, and he's going he's gonna to come, say, into my life. He's going to, now, Jeff, I'm, I'm glad you're on this path with me and you keep going, but, but let's just pause for a second, Jeff. You've, you've got this part of your life here that you have not yet given me. You're, you're still holding on to this. You, you haven't surrendered that specific part of my life. Please give it to me. See, this is what our growth is all about because then I have a choice. At that moment, I can go, you know, you know what, God, you're right. I, I'm holding that part of my life. I'm holding on to something. I, I haven't surrendered that. So here, God, I, I surrender it to you. I, I, I give that part of my life to you. And then if that happens then we just keep on going down that process and we keep growing and eventually we're going to get to something else where specifically, God's going to get real specific with us. He's going to come into our lives again very clearly through His Word and His Holy Spirit. And he's going to say, now, now Jeff, I'm so glad you're, going to con you're continuing to grow and all of this. But here's another part now that, that we've come to that you need to surrender. You need to give to me. And see, what happens is in those moments... We have a choice because God's not going to force us to surrender or force us to do this. He wants to, us to cooperate with him, but obviously we understand we don't always as Christians cooperate with what God wants to do in our lives. And when those moments come where God says, Jeff, I want you to give me that part of your life that you haven't yet surrendered, if we say no, then in a sense what we do is we sort of suspend 
whatever growth could be taking place because God won't let us then just continue to go. He's going to always bring us back to this and say, I can't let you go any further with me down this road until, until you give me that. So it, it's really detrimental to our growth whenever God brings us to this point where he's looking for that wholeness in our life and he specifically points out areas in our life that we need to give over to him and we're not willing to do so. Because God won't just, like sometimes maybe we do with others or others do with us, or say, oh, well, okay, well, then let's just keep going. No, God doesn't work that way. That's why many of us as Christians, it seems like we have to keep going in a circle and learning the same lesson over and over and over. And, and God keeps trying to teach us the same lesson over. And we might even wonder, God, why am I having to keep dealing with this? Because God's saying, just like a training coach would, well, I, we can't move on to the next exercise until you get this down. Because what God understands, and maybe sometimes we miss, is that just like a good training coach, the way he's building us has purpose just as to what he's doing. In other words, God understands, I can't, I can't train you for this and build you up in this until you get this. This is foundational to this. So you, you, you and I have to be on the same page here, and, and you've got to start making progress in this area before I can bring you to this other level. Because it's all building together. God has a perfect plan and purpose for our lives, and his plan has this great continuity to it. And that's why we've got to be willing to learn to cooperate with God as he makes us whole. Because each step of the way, as we surrender each of these parts of our life, they all build on one another, bring us to where God wants to take us, which is to make us completely his, whereby we become whole people. We are being prepared to meet our bridegroom. That, that's why Paul uses the, the idea that husband and wife is like Christ in his church, and the church being the bride, and Jesus obviously being the bridegroom. And he's saying, look, do you realize as a Christian that one day you're going to meet your bridegroom? And can I say, here's one of the big differences between the culture of Jesus and our culture. When there's marriages and weddings that take place today in our culture, the bride is the center of all attention. I mean, when you do a wedding today, all eyes are on the bride, and it's about her walking up the aisle and all that. In Jesus' culture, the center of attention was never on the bride. It was always on the bridegroom. And Jesus then is using that to help us understand, look, I'm your bridegroom. You're my bride. I'm using this time in your life to prepare you to meet me. I want you to be ready to meet me. And when you meet me, I want you to be whole. That's what Paul's talking about in Ephesians. And that's why, can I say, if we go back just for a moment to 1 Thessalonians, not chapter 5, but I want to show you this. That's why, starting in chapter 1 of 1 Thessalonians, at the end of every chapter in this letter, Paul mentions the coming of Jesus. He wants to remind these people, listen, there's a reason why God is seeking to make you whole. Because he wants to present you to himself, as Paul said in the Ephesian passage as this wonderful bride that has made herself ready. So what we need to do is think of our lives as readying ourselves and preparing ourselves to meet our bridegroom. And guess what? He's coming. Amen. He's coming. And see, in Jesus' day, what happened was a couple would get betrothed, but then they wouldn't start living together or consummating the marriage until sometime later. And the bride never knew when the bridegroom would come to get her to consummate the marriage and for them to start living together. So they would come together, in a sense, get betrothed to each other, and then they would separate. And he would go to his home, and she would go back to her home. And you can imagine 
The anticipation and the expectation, not only for the bride, but for all of their family and friends to think about, wonder when the bridegroom is going to leave his house, come and get the bride, and then take his bride back to his home. When's this going to happen? And the Bible uses that great picture for us as the kind of mindset and perspective that we should have as we think about, my goodness, my whole life is, should be in preparation to meet my bridegroom, Jesus. Which is why then Paul reminds them of the coming of Jesus. Look at chapter 1, verse 10 where Paul mentions to the Thessalonians, and to wait for his son from heaven. Then look at chapter 2, verse 19. For who is our hope or joy or crown to boast of before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Look at chapter 3, verse 13. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 4, verse 15. For we tell you this by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left, until the coming of the Lord. And then in chapter 5, we saw it this morning in verse 23, at the very end, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Every chapter, there is at the end of every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, a reference to the coming of Jesus. Why? Because he's reminding us, our whole life should be lived in preparation to meet our bridegroom. And we don't know when our bridegroom's coming any more than the bride in Jesus' day knew when the bridegroom was coming, which means I need to always be ready and I need to be living my life in a state of continual preparation and readiness to meet my bridegroom. Is that how we approach life? Paul is saying to the Thessalonians, to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, this is, should be how we approach life. Are we living every day in light of meeting our bridegroom? Are we waking up every day saying, I need to use today to prepare myself and ready myself to meet Jesus? Paul says, if we as Christians could wake up every day and pour ourselves into that kind of a, a mindset, a perspective, a life, then the wholeness will take care of itself. But how many days go by in our weeks, in our months, in our years, where we don't even think about meeting Jesus someday? We don't even think about his return. We don't even think about the coming of our bridegroom and seeing him one day. Because we get so immersed, if you will, in our lives that our attention is taken off of what really could make us whole and result in peace in our lives. Which is instead of running after all these other things that will never bring us peace of mind and tranquility, that we focus ourselves on preparing ourselves to meet our bridegroom. In fact, the word for coming here that's used in throughout 1 Thessalonians is a word that spoke in Paul's day of a royal visit of a king. And Paul's saying, do you realize your king is coming? Are you preparing yourselves every day to meet your king? Now again, Paul says, don't try to get yourself ready and prepared all by yourself. Paul says, do it within the fellowship of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Which is why Paul ends 1 Thessalonians 5 the way he does. Well, one other passage I'd like to take you to today. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 25. It's the parable of the ten virgins. And let me just say this. Many Christians are tripped up by the parables of Jesus 
because they try to make everything that Jesus says mean something. And that's never the intent of a parable. A parable is primarily a story that had one or at the most two primary things that they were trying to get across. It was never meant to, oh, what does that, you know, every little thing had meaning behind it. That, that's not what a parable is used for. So that's where a lot of times Christians get into the parable and go, well, well that, what's that? No. When Jesus uses parables, he's trying to just get a couple key points across to his followers. And I want to point out these couple of points from the parable of the ten virgins that fall in line with what we've been talking about here today, being ready to meet our bridegroom. Follow along with me as I read the parable. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. He says, five of the virgins were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish ones took their lamps, they did not take extra olive oil with them. But the wise ones took flasks of olive oil with their lamps. When the bridegroom was delayed a long time, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, the bridegroom is here. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there won't be enough for you and for us. Go instead to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they had gone to buy it, the bridegroom arrived, and those who were ready went inside with him to the wedding banquet. Then the door was shut. Later the other virgins came too, saying, Lord, Lord, let us in. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. Therefore, stay alert because you do not know the day or the hour. One very important truth that Jesus is teaching is this. You and I can't transfer, if you will, our state of preparedness or readiness to meet our bridegroom to someone else. You and I are personally responsible for us. And every Christian is personally responsible for their own walk and readiness and preparedness before the Lord. And these foolish virgins were not prepared, but they couldn't live off of the preparedness and readiness of the five wise virgins. That's not how it works. I can't, I can't expect, you know, uh, what, what kind of commitment and dedication and wholeness is, is happening in someone else's life to somehow be transferred to me at some point. I've got to be willing to be made whole and to be willing to be holy gods and let, begin to surrender my life and begin to use every day as a day of preparation and readiness to meet my bridegroom because I don't know when he's coming or when I will meet him. So that's one big truth here. I can't transfer my readiness to someone else. And then the other thing that we see here is that I can't wait to the last minute to be ready. I, I can't, like a lot of people, you know, it's like when you talk to someone about even knowing the Lord and all that, like, well, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to put that off for a while, you know. Maybe as I get closer to, to, the, to the dying age, then I'll, I'll make sure that my spiritual house is in order. Well, the Bible would say that's foolish. Because first of all, none of us knows when we're going to die. We could die very unexpectedly. And we don't have that last minute, you know. We might try to, we might try to wing that 
in life sometimes where we procrastinate, we procrastinate, we procrastinate, and we let something go to the last minute, and then we try to throw something together at the last minute. And hey, every once in a while, I get it. You might actually pull something off to where, oh man, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that came together because I don't think anybody noticed that I just threw that together at the last minute. That might happen every once in a while. But spiritually, what Jesus is saying here, that won't happen spiritually. You can't put off being prepared and ready and then all of a sudden think, oh my goodness, bridegroom's coming. Okay, I'm going to go from, from here where I'm at spiritually here to where I need to be. No. Because what Jesus is also teaching here is being ready to meet our bridegroom and being prepared to meet our bridegroom starts now. And it's an everyday readiness and preparation. It's not of, well, you know, when I get a little bit older or when I get to this stage in my life, then I'm going to get serious about spiritual things. No, 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 no. We all know. That ain't never going to happen. What Jesus is saying is, not only can we not live off of the preparedness and readiness of others, but we can't wait to the last minute before the bridegroom arrives and think somehow I'm going to get my whole life, my whole life, every part of my body, soul, and spirit in order to meet my bridegroom. No. Because what God will do is he's going to work on us little parts and little pieces at a time throughout our Christian life. And he's going to come along and say, now, Jeff, how about that? Will you give me that? Hey, Jeff, you've been holding out in that area of your life for quite a while now. I think it's time that you surrender that to me. Now, here's again the thing. If I say no over and over again, God's not going to give up. God's going to keep working. God's going to keep trying to bring me to a point where I will be willing to cooperate with him and give over of my life more and more to him. Why? Because God loves me. And God knows that the best thing for me is to be being made holy. And the way I become whole is by becoming holy his. Every day of our Christian life should be a day where we spend to ready ourselves or prepare ourselves to meet our bridegroom, the King. This is an essential of our faith. Let's pray. God, some of us here today may be truly anticipating and expecting our bridegroom's return. While others here may not be so anxious because they know that there's parts of their life that they're not cooperating with you about. They're holding out. And you've talked to them about this as you talk to all of us about these things throughout our time with you. So God, I just pray today for all of us that we would realize what Paul was teaching throughout these passages of Scripture. That God came to make us whole individuals. To bring us together, to tie up all the loose ends of our life that can be so scattered and that bring about a lack of peace in our life and tie everything together to make us whole. And the only way, God, that wholeness happens is when we're willing to become wholly yours. God, we're going to sing here in just a moment. It is well with my soul. Lord, that song was not written because everything was perfectly right in that author's life when he wrote it. 
What he was saying was, God, I've been through something horrific, but God, I'm willing to cooperate with you in it. I'm willing to do things now your way rather than mine. I'm willing to surrender, God, to you and give you whatever I need to give you instead of holding out and holding on. So I pray, God, that as we sing this song today, may it be from us also a song of, of commitment and dedication to say, God, help us to get ready and prepared to meet our bridegroom. Help us not to keep procrastinating and putting things off like those foolish virgins. And help us not think that somehow, that because others are prepared and ready, somehow we can live off of their readiness and preparedness. Each of us are personally responsible as your child to make ourselves ready and to prepare ourselves. May we surrender to you, God, today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.